I attended a military boarding school for high school. Here's a picture of me playing army. Here's a picture of me riding a horse. You get it. Living with a bunch of guys in a dorm that only had two TVs and you only had about an hour a day to watch anything, if that, really meant that you were dealing with the lowest common denominator when it came to whatever you were going to watch. I can't tell you how many times between my freshman and junior years that I watched 300. But you could be sure that every weekend somebody would bring up their binder of DVDs and we'd all go and have a watch party of some random movie that somebody had. I don't tell you this to open up to you, to let you in on the mysterious backstory that I've been cultivating over the past year. No. I tell you this to explain where my love for sharing movies comes from. And it was not only my love for sharing movies that was created in this environment. It was also my love for the bargain bin at Walmart, where cultural moments go to be lost, but never forgotten. But with the help of my substantial following here on the YouTubes, I decided that I'm going to shine a light on some movies that you may have forgotten even existed. Like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Do you remember February 2009? I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to the, the audience, not... I know they can't respond. It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to interject all the time. Well, if you don't remember February 2009, President Obama was just inaugurated, the iPod was a valid piece of electronic equipment that everyone had, and the Steelers just won or were about to win the Super Bowl. I don't know. I didn't do the research. This was a point in time where superhero films were about a decade into being valid box office money makers, but had yet to be fully commercialized and commoditized as they are today. For reference, it was December 2009 when Marvel was bought by Disney for oodles of dollars, and their competitor DC was more focused on creating solo projects for single characters, like the Dark Knight trilogy, Superman Returns, and Jonah Hex. Never forget Jonah Hex. Bring back the Brolin. So along with having a big demand for superhero cinema, there was also a movement for independent studios to try to make it big, especially trying to capitalize on that comic book adjacent properties. In the 2000s, you got the rise of independent companies like Blumhouse and Marvel, before it was bought by Disney, and you have catastrophic failures like Relativity Media. Actually, Relativity Media's just insane downfall is actually an interesting story, and maybe I'll get into that in a future video. All of these production companies were vying for those two magic words, intellectual property. Eon Flux, Ultraviolet, Jumper, Hancock, Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun-Li, these are all superhero type films that were released in the last five years of the 2000s. And they represent what was this era of cinematic superhero adolescence. And it was in February of 2009 where a film that fully encapsulated this moment was released. Push. Push was written by David Borla and directed by Paul McGuigan, director of Lucky Number Slevin and several television episodes of Sherlock, Carnival Row, Luke Cage, and Big Sky. The film is about a group of super people that are hiding out in Hong Kong that get into this whole government conspiracy cat and mouse chase involving government agencies and the triad that all build up to this heist third act. Everyone has supernatural abilities and it's a whole lot of fun. Look, the film is overly convoluted with a bunch of twists and turns that really need to be explained in detail to understand, so it's either me do that very simple, brief explanation of the movie, or I'm sitting here for three hours giving you the movie beat by beat. You get it? It's kind of older millennials X-Men with a conspiracy thriller backdrop to the movie. And it's not like X-Men where every character has a different superpower. They're broken down into categories, so while there's a variety of powers, you know what, you'll get it. So there's movers, people with telekinetic abilities. Watchers, people who are clairvoyant and can see the future. Pushers, people who can make people do things with their mind. <laughs> Bleeders, people who emit a hypersonic scream that causes people to explode or things to explode. A fish explodes, no people explode. Sniffers, those who can track you based on your scent anywhere around the world. And a variety of others. 
Push follows Nick, played by Chris Evans, who, after watching his father get killed by a government organization led by a pusher called Carver, played by Jaimon Hanso, he spends his life hiding in a heavily populated area of Hong Kong. It's established that he has difficulty controlling his powers as a mover, but don't worry, if you thought that that was going to be a character journey and he was going to struggle and it was going to be linked intrinsically to the story, he kind of just gets the hang of it once the action starts. He does get better at his power as the movie progresses, but it's just not a key element of his character arc. He is confronted by a teenage watcher, Cassie, played by Dakota Fanning, who sets him on a mission that apparently involves her mother, who is captured and imprisoned by this government organization, and finding a case of money that will make them all rich. But hold the phone. It's not about money at all. It's actually about a pusher named Kira, played by Camilla Bell, who Nick had a thing with prior to the movie starting. Don't worry, we'll get to that. It's a weird coincidence. As well as taking the secret superhero steroid, created by the government that's supposed to enhance the natural abilities of anyone who has powers. But it's only ever killed the test subjects who've tried it, until Kira. So yeah, the movie is essentially everybody's trying to get Kira and this steroid, and Cassie keeps seeing a bunch of visions of her and Nick dying. One of the things that Push has going for it is its tone. Push takes itself very seriously, and it works, despite the weird shit that it throws at the wall. The film is grounded. Relatively grounded. Well, as grounded as a movie can be when there's this in it. Ah! Yeah! Love that. Objectively hilarious. The plot isn't this end of the world bullshit that we've grown accustomed to after a decade of these. It's a chase story that turns into a heist movie in the third act that all revolves around a superhero steroid MacGuffin. One of the best examples of the grounded nature of this movie is the way the movers generally just kind of use their power just to hold guns super far away from themselves. Look at that floating in the air, shooting a gun. It's not superpowers like, you know, Hadoukens or all this crazy shit. It's just using your superpower as an extension of yourself. And the way they represent that specific power, the telekinesis movers powers, they add this rainbow lens flare to it, which is kind of a nice visually striking way to add to your movie. I dig it. Another good thing is all of these characters have a personal stake to the story that is being told, despite sometimes having some hand-wavy screenwriting techniques to get everybody to the story. Nick wants to protect Kira, Cassie wants to save her mother, Carver wants to get Kira and the steroid, and he doesn't care who he has to go through to get it. A nice touch that, as I said, isn't a focal part of the movie is that Nick, being out of practice, isn't too great at his power. We're shown in his first scene as an adult that he's trying to scam people out of money by cheating at dice. And he fails to move a single die and he loses all of his money and gets chased away. As the film progresses, he becomes more proficient to the point that he's able to handle himself against another mover that he was shown to have had struggles against earlier in the film. Cassie has visions of the future, but in order to express fully what the visions are, she draws them. But since she's a child and not a good artist, It's not a olive, it's a bead. It's a bead? Her drawings kind of suck. And that's just a nice touch. Why does everybody who has visions, I'm talking to you Stranger Things season four, why does everybody who sees visions immediately able to draw exactly what they saw? Another plus for the film is the side characters. Basically everyone we meet, no, not basically, everyone we meet in this film is super powered in some way. And you can always go back to what their superpower is to see how they present themselves. There's the Sniffers that are working for the agency, played by Corey Stahl and Scott Michael Campbell. They are as gross as you would think someone would be if their superpower was an enhanced olfactory system. Basically human bloodhounds with a healthy serving size of creepy. 
Cliff Curtis plays Hook Waters, a guy with a superpower to change any object into a different object for a temporary amount of time. So what does he do? He presents himself as a casino magician, and he's very suave. Ming Na Wen is also a sniffer, but instead of being a creepy sniffing dude, she presents herself as this refined sommelier of black market goods. Maggie Sif plays a stitch, or somebody who can heal someone else's body by touching them and moving them and rubbing on them. So she presents her black market doctor for superpowered beings as this overworked masseuse. And Nate Mooney, better known as Ryan McPoyle from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, plays what is called a shadow, or somebody whose superpower is to be able to hide anyone in a certain radius of them from any sniffers, watchers, or whatever super being it is that is looking for them. And since his superpower is essentially anonymity, he just presents himself as another face lost in the crowd. Hell, even the bleeders taking off their sunglasses before the- <laughs> <gasps> is an example of character-motivated action specific to their powers, as their screams have been shown to shatter fish tanks, which are, I'm hoping, thicker than sunglasses. It's a testament of Push's scripting, directing, and wardrobe department that these characters truly fit, making this world feel genuine and lived in. And finally, The performances of the majority of the cast are spot on and keep the audience engaged, especially at points when the script is kind of going off the rails a little bit. Now, I'm going to say something controversial, something that not many people agree with. Are you ready? Here's a secret. Chris Evans is really good at leading a superhero film. I know, it's controversial and everything, nobody really believes me, but... I swear to God, he's got a future in this thing. He plays Nick as absolutely not wanting to get involved in the conflict, wanting to keep a low profile, especially powerful because we saw at the beginning of the movie, he knows what happened to his dad, who was involved in a, some sort of conflict with the government. He wants to stay off the radar and live his life. But through the journey he goes on, the struggles he encounters when trying to go off on his own, and the connections that he has with the conflict, Nick finds himself taking a leadership role in this ragtag group. For the performance of Cassie, there's a moment where she wants to get stronger visions to know exactly what's going to happen in the future, as the future is malleable. So she was told by her mother that when she drinks, she gets better visions. So there's a scene where Dakota Fanning plays that she's drunk off her ass, and it's delightful. And Jaimon Hanso as Carver is just a fantastic villain. Especially as one that can make anyone do anything he wants with just a word. He gives this very understated performance, very calm and collected as if nothing can faze him, but he's just a menacing presence that really fits the dangerous he's got the government backing him and also if you try to come at him he'll make you kill yourself. This lack of paranoia and complete feeling that he has control over every situation, you know, kinda leads to his untimely demise, as he doesn't seem to worry about Nick's plan unfolding as the third act goes on, but, you know, he had a good run. Even Xiao Lu Li, playing a character only known as Pop Girl, daughter of the Triad family, the Bleeders, she's their watcher sister, and she is wonderful as an antagonistic character to Cassie. She appears out of nowhere every so often to just taunt Cassie that she knows the future and knows when they're gonna die and she knows the future better than Cassie does so what is Cassie gonna do? This creates a dynamic between the characters where they are playing chess but know exactly how the moves are going to go but they keep playing. The one potential dark spot in the cast is Camilla Bell as Kira. And to get into that, we need to talk more about her character and why it may not be her fault. I don't want to blame her, but 10,000 BC doesn't help her case that she is up to snuff. Kira just doesn't make any sense, you guys. I don't know. She escapes from a high security building, but in a way that there is no way that her powers would have known that that was going to happen. She is a pusher. Her powers are 
to make people do things with her mind. She wouldn't be able to know that dropping a glass orb would somehow roll through the hallways and stop in a door jam so that when she decides to escape and they decide to lock down the building, it would stop the door from closing, allowing her to get in and shut the door so nobody can follow her. She's doing this chase escape type thing after taking a steroid that literally killed everyone else who took it. She is not in the best of shape is what I'm saying to be able to make a sort of break for it. And that superpowered steroid also doesn't seem to have any effect on what she can do. Well, no, it does in the end. She's able to control four people instead of one person. But I didn't know that that was special other than one line of dialogue that I literally forgot until just now. She doesn't bring anything emotionally to the table. We care about her because Nick cares about her. Our emotions are connected to her through him. Other than that, like, I don't care about him because of her. I be care about him because he's the protagonist and it's Chris Evans and I like cellular. But the fact that she's not bringing much to the table isn't necessarily her fault and isn't necessarily the director's fault, although he probably could have done a little bit of something. I kind of see it as more of a script problem. So the first act of the movie, she's on the run. That's all her character is. We only see a couple scenes with her, and it's basically just survival. Not much to it. I get it. But eventually we'll get to know her and get to understand the character and begin to care about her, right? Immediately once the second act starts, she meets Nick, and... Kira? What is that supposed to mean? I thought you left. You stopped returning my call. Division caught me and locked me up. What? Boy, is that a lot of exposition to come out of nowhere. But for the rest of the second act, she's kind of hanging out in a hotel room with Ryan McPoyle while Nick and Cassie do all of the action because if anybody sees her, the jig is up. They're trying to hide her. But then at the beginning of the third act, when she gets kidnapped by Carver, she is mind-fucked by him to make it seem like she was working with him and his partner the whole time, and she volunteered to get injected with his deadly steroid, and she just lost her sense of self and went crazy. That's what's going on. So the whole third act, she's this emotionless, just blank, going through the motions, trying to kill people. And so it's this whole, the crux of the ending where it hinges on Kira's emotion to Nick, it just doesn't work. Cause Nick is threatened to kill himself by injecting him with the steroid and she doesn't care. The character of Kira is mostly emotionless, which doesn't help the audience connect to a story that almost entirely hinges on her as a focal point. But Nick's emotional connection to her kind of makes us connect with it. Push is a very silly film. It thinks it's smarter than it really is. But its enthusiasm for its ridiculous premise being played super straight makes it an enjoyable experience. Now that makes sense when the movie was directed by the guy who did Lucky Number Slevin, but hey, forgettable yet enjoyable isn't the worst thing that a film could be. Get deep. How can I get deeper into a film that's not trying to be deep in the first place? It's a fun little moment in Chris Evans' career that is post Fantastic Four movies and pre Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. It's a nice performance by Jaimon Hanso, and it's got enough twists and turns to keep an audience engaged long enough so that they don't think too much about the story that they're being told and they start to ask questions because those questions are not going to benefit the movie. But it's also worth a watch because it's a decent example of the types of films that were being made before studios and production companies were more into building franchisable intellectual property and were instead just trying to produce a single entertaining film. And it's just a much more innocent time, you know? Where you didn't need 30 hours of movies and 50 hours of television shows to understand why a Viking space god was around and a kid can shoot spider webs and climb walls. You can just make a movie. A good one. Thank you for watching. Yes, you. I appreciate your time. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you can be kept abreast of all the new videos and content that's coming out in the next couple months. And you know what? Screw you, man. Don't. Don't subscribe. I don't even care. I don't even care anymore. I'm just saying words right now.
I, I have nothing left written on here. I'm just, don't watch, don't like, don't subscribe. You know what? Say how terrible this video is. I don't even care anymore. I mean, I need to try something. The subscriber count's gotta get up somehow. Gotta pump those numbers out. I brought a chicken breast out. I'm doing props now.